Each doryman can tell how well the other is doing. The more fish he takes, the lower his dory rides in the water. In high seas, the heavier the catch, the greater the danger of being swamped. But it is said that the doryman would rather sink than throw away a single cod. For this sense of competition, a real reason. The men are paid on the basis of their catch. Some will be consistently good, taking in as much as a half ton a day. Others consistently bad, never once filling their dories to capacity. Regardless of their skill, all share one incentive in common. The ship cannot return home until it is full, its hold bulging with almost a thousand tons of cod. Therefore, the greater each day's catch, the closer they all are to home. Climbing aboard with the assistance of the waves can prove an unpredictable entrance. A sudden gust of wind has been known to sweep men aboard still seated in their dories. But once safely on deck, another phase of work begins. After 12 hours of fishing, they must now clean and pack their catch. Forming an assembly line, each man is assigned a specific task. A throater, cutting three strokes from the throat, opens the fish to send it down the line. A liverer removes the liver and other valued parts. Then a splitter cuts the fish in two, sending it toward the back. With all hands participating, an ocean-going factory, humming with the pride of a tremendous first day's success. 20,000 pounds of fresh cod, the omen of a good campaign. And below the factory, a sea-going salt mine. Due to lack of refrigeration, the fish are packed in layers of salt, losing more than half their weight as the salt drains them of water. The more they dry, the more that can fit in the hold. And as the days wear on, the captain will actually hope for rough seas to pack them tightly against each other and allow room for more still. This, the most crucial process. A fraction too much or too little salt will make the entire cargo worthless. The working day begins to wane. Twelve hours of fishing, six hours of cleaning, only six hours left to eat and sleep. But tonight is a special night, and they will find time for just one more event. The birthday of Juan Varel, on this day, 52 years of age. Had the day not been successful, it is likely that none would have celebrated. Fisherman Juan dos Santos Pareiro, residence Vila do Conde, born 1916. Likely he will continue with the fleet until he is no longer able. He could retire, but what then to do with his summers? To finish, the first day's fishing is steeped in tradition. In an atmosphere changing to quiet reverence, the first meal is served. It is called the soup of sorrows. Those that partake of it will be alive to return to the Grand Banks again next year. The serving that follows is fresh potatoes and boiled cod. Taxing the chef's skills, in the months to come, cod will be served in more than a hundred different ways. Oh, no. 
The party continues, but in a few hours they must all re enter the sea. For Varero, the end of a happy day. The beginning of his 27th year as Doryman for the Jose Alberto. The traditional first stop in Newfoundland can bring grief and frustration. In an instant, the gates of ice are closed and all safely inside the harbor of St. John's must bide their time until the sea allows them to leave. Said to be the oldest settlement in North America, for one season each year, St. John's becomes a cosmopolitan port of call, entertaining the fishing fleets of 14 different nations as they stop for fresh bait, fresh food, and that most precious cargo of all, a shipment of mail from home. For the men of Jose Alberto, it is the first communication from loved ones since their departure from Lisbon. In the months at sea, many things at home will change. Children will be born, relatives will die, and quite often, love letters from the girl in Lisbon will be answered with a long-distance proposal of marriage. Days of waiting for the ice to break bring frustration. For wasted time means less fish and more days away from home. <laughs> to pass the idle hours, some will visit a building called the Portuguese Center, established on St. John's in tribute to this fleet that has been stopping on its shores for so many centuries. Here, entertainment comes in many forms. There are books to read, people to meet, and perhaps some wages to be lost in friendly competition with fishermen from other countries. Others will pass the time in a continuing game of soccer, with teams of one ship competing with the next, sometimes supplementing their lineup with the eager children of St. John's. For most, there is one serious responsibility, visiting the graves of relatives and fellow fishermen who in years past came to St. John's to stay. Written in stone on this distant shore are the chronicles of entire family history, the names of great-grandfathers, fathers, and sons, now resting side by side where their fleet first put them ashore. of warm breeze has broken the ice and all must make their escape. Beneath flags of France, Spain, Russia and Sweden, each ship begins a new journey in search of the cart. For the men of the Jose Alberto, destination Arctic Circle. In search of better fishing, a course due north into the midnight sun. <laughs> 